Okay, recording in progress. Um, uh, do we have Nico here yet? Hi, Trisha, I'm here. Oh, good. Hi, Nico, how are you? I'm well, thanks for having me tonight. I really appreciate the chance to speak with everybody. We're really happy to have you, everyone. Nico is the new principal of PS150. Um, if you did not know that yet, please welcome um, him to our committee meeting tonight. We hope to have you as a visitor many times in the future. And we look forward to working together with you to get your beautiful school transitioned down to Trinity next fall. Um, we are full on now in our uh, quest for information from you for you. Um, we have, I want you to know uh, going into tonight's meeting that we have not heard back from the DOT specifically, but I was able to get some information today. And we have requested the second of two meetings that they told us we would be having outside of this meeting schedule to discuss um, issues related to the school opening. Um, the reason we do that is because we have the DOT, the DOE. This meeting is also gonna have the MTA because they're the ones that control the spur coming out of the uh, battery tunnel and uh, the SCA as well. So um, we found that it's helpful to have them all together in one room, but I do have a little bit of information for you and for the committee about where things stand right now. Um, the DOT, uh, as we know, uh, last late last spring committed to uh, closing the westbound lane of Edgar Street to extend the very narrow seven foot sidewalk that borders the south side of the school. This was important um, for a bunch of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that the courtyard is only 600 square feet and you have uh, 470 students plus other caretakers being in elementary school, um, which was going to be a challenge in that small space. So we are thrilled for this news. It helped that the building mechanicals had to be extended um, 10 feet. So it turns out that they were not going to be able to keep that uh, lane anyway. Um, there had been some things up in the air uh, that I have now confirmed not to be true. One of which was that they were someone had said that they were gonna take the median out and make two lanes of traffic in a smaller amount of space. Anybody who's been to Edgar Street knows that it is an odd street and that it has one lane going in each direction, but it is separated by a six foot wide median. It turns out that there are mechanicals of some sort for the city underneath that median. So they can't dig it up and make it a street. They can't do anything with it except pave up to it. So they are only going to be keeping one lane of traffic going east on Edgar Street. They are going to pave, they're not going to pave over. They're going to close the westbound lane of Edgar Street and they are not paving over it. That is going to be uh, capital money that we have to come up with, initiate and get done. So I have asked, uh, you know, we are reaching out to the borough president, um, our council member and other elected officials to see where we can get the capital funds to do that paving so that we have a contiguous uh, plaza where you have one surface from the sidewalk across the street and meeting the median. We are hoping and especially since we got this information now, we are hoping that we can get this all done by the time school opens. And as a result, we had asked the DOT to make the school close or the street closure uh, in advance of three or four months so that we have time to do that work before school opens. So that's where that is. The plaza will uh, meet, you know, at that corner. The plaza will be, you know, that 30 feet thick coming or 25 feet thick coming southbound, and it will meet that 12 foot deep sidewalk on the Trinity Play side. And that will facilitate the children moving from that bus stop, which I also found out has been confirmed for the southwest corner 
of Edgar and Trinity. And so you'll you know notice that the, the bus is going to come eastbound on Edgar. To the north of the bus now is the plaza. So there's no traffic to cut cross. Buses, as you know, have their doors on the right side. So there are New York City buses, I found out today, that have a door on the left side, but they're very hard to come by because there aren't that many of them. So we can put in a request for them so that the children exit directly out onto the plaza, um, which of course would be ideal. But in the event that they have to exit out the right side, it's still fine because the bus will uh, open the door, the children will walk out and the bus will not move. And the children will walk in front of the bus across the plaza and into the school on the corner of Trinity and Edgar without ever having to come in contact with any cars. So that's good news too. Um, but that unfortunately is all I have for you. Oh, the one other thing I have is that the SCA did not include a covering on the courtyard. We had put that in as a wish list item because on rainy days, you do not have a large indoor gathering space for everybody to flood into. And we have this problem at some of our middle schools, but with little kids, it's a little harder to get them to move quickly and corral them into an elevator bank. So they said it's not going to happen. We're gonna continue um, we're gonna continue pursuing that because we think it could be good even if we have a half shelter for that area so that the teachers and the principal, if you're there, can um, be able to greet the kids outside and move them into the lobby without being soaking wet. Um, so that's where everything is right now. And um, if you have questions, Nico, and if any of our committee members have questions to take back to them, um, they've asked us to prepare a list for the meeting, which of course you'll be attending, Nico, um, and then we'll we'll be able to get that together for them. Thank you so much, Trisha. Thanks to everybody, and uh, you know, especially to, to to Rosa Chang who invited me tonight. Um, yeah, I just appreciate all of your help. I see some. There's apparently 150 parent alums here uh, on the call. Um, so hello, oh, I see. Hi, Wendy. I've, I've heard a lot about you. Um, <laughs> And I appreciate all that the committee is doing for uh, 150 and the kids. Um, I did. I was able to get in touch with uh, Lucian. I sent. Um, I sent an email yesterday, kind of outlining outlining all of a lot of many concerns that parents are sharing with me around uh, the school building and transportation, and just kind of navigating the streets as the city gets busier and busier. Um, and uh, you know, we have very young children and. It's just, uh, I'm just trying to avoid a lot of potentially, you know, any serious issues um, before we move into, into the new building. Um, and, uh, you know, coming from 276, where it was a new building as well. Uh, and it took, you know, I was working with Tammy Meltzer for many years to try to get signage even posted um, mm -hmm. to slow down, some stop signs, a crossing guard, things like that, that, um, that, that, uh, yeah, anything would be appreciated. I would, I would love to join that meeting with DOT, MTA, SCA, uh, et cetera. So thank we you. We will definitely be arranging that. And to that end, I, the MTA note that I um, didn't mention is that we have confirmed that the spur will be closed um, in the mornings. Awesome. The, the reason they couldn't close it in the afternoons is that there are a lot of empty buses that come up through the battery tunnel unbeknownst to me that go up into the city to pick everybody up and bring them back out and there is apparently no other way for them to get there this you know they the spur will be closed in the mornings completely until after the kids are in school so until until about 11 really and it's really going to be the afternoons when they're released, that will be the challenge because those buses will be coming up at 2.33, 3.34 um, into the city on that bus ramp up Edgar Street. So 
That's going to be a big question for the MTA and the DOT is how that's going to go with the school buses, as well as the fact that the school buses were not, are not going to have an idling place. They're going to have to be timed incredibly well because there is nowhere for a bus to stop anywhere um, unless they do some sort of curb cut um, on the plaza on the west side where it meets Greenwich Street meets Edgar Street. And that's a possibility, and we're talking about that, the size of a bus, where we do a curb cut, in other words, and instead of paving over all the way down to Greenwich Street, we leave a little curb cut for that, that bus there, just one bus. So we'll also have to see how many kids are coming by bus. You know, that's gonna be a question too. Um, so there's, there's still a lot of questions, and, and that's why the DOE will be there because you know, hopefully they will have done some projections as to what we're gonna be looking at um, in terms of uh, student body. And I, I would imagine most of them will be traveling from the East, but um, how many will be out of our district, we don't know yet. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see what kinds of things we can put into place. And of course, we'd like to hear from you um, as we go through this process in terms of what your needs are and what um, hasn't been communicated with you yet that we can help facilitate? You know, if you haven't heard from the DOE, if there are some questions you have about the layout, walkthroughs, things like that, make sure to reach out to us and we can see what we can do to help you, you know, communicate. Sometimes it's challenging at this stage when they're in construction. Thank you so much. Sure. Does anybody else have any questions? I see chat here, hold on, I'm gonna click on it. Nope, everybody, I don't see anything Actually, yet. Sure. Do you have any hands up? Trisha, I, uh -huh. have, I have a question. Um, hi, this is Rosa. Hi, hey, Rosa. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry, you went through a really, really detailed um, explanation of where the buses were going to stop and I still honestly, I'm totally confused. Um, where it's okay, <laughs> it's okay. It was hard for me to envision at first. So if you will, Edgar yeah. Street runs east and west along the right. south side of the building. Yeah. The yeah. courtyard is on the east side of the building. Yeah. So yeah. so the bus is going to come from you know the west like through the battery garage is what I'm thinking he's going to have to do. I don't really understand how it's going to get there yet, but I'm I'm waiting for them to tell me they've got they said they've got the whole thing down. Um, if the spur is closed um, so anyway, it's going to come from the West. It's going to drive across Edgar Street. It's going to stop at the corner of Edgar and Trinity. To the left of that bus, here's the building. This is all plaza. So if we can get a door where the kids can walk out and just go in the courtyard on Trinity Place, awesome. They don't come in contact with anything. If they go out the right side, they're going out onto the median, right? I'm sorry, onto Liz Berger Park. So if they go out the right side, they're releasing onto the sidewalk that borders Liz Berger Park. And then they're gonna walk around the front of the bus and cross the front of the bus onto the plaza. They're still not crossing any other traffic, but they're crossing in front of the bus. And the bus is stopping the traffic from behind it, which can't pass the bus. So it's actually a very safe, um, and smart, I think, place for the bus to stop. Because they also, you know, we originally thought about Greenwich Street, but they're little kids and they could have a longer walk to go down Edgar and then across and into the entrance on Trinity Place. So I actually right. think this is a really good idea and the kids will not come in contact or cross any lanes of traffic. As you might recall, the first bus stop they thought of was on the north, I'm sorry, southeast corner of Trinity and Rector. This is way better than that location because they would have had to cross all those lanes of that very aggressive bus traffic coming up from the battery to get to the school. That would have been very, very bad. So this I think was a great solution. Um, and I'm sure that at the meeting they will have sketches um, for everybody to see, but um, but I think it's gonna I think it's a good solution if they can find somewhere. I mean, timing 
in terms of the pickup, given that they have nowhere to idle unless they do the curb cut, um, is going to be their biggest challenge with that location. So, so just just to, to be sure, because I'm sorry, I'm just yeah. not quite getting. They're going to be closed. They're set, the buses will essentially be closing the single lane that's eastbound on Edgar to either let off at the Burger Plaza or to let off directly onto you know if we can get the money together the the extended plaza off of the school. Yeah, so left door would be left door would be onto the plaza. Right door would yeah. be onto the sidewalk of Lisberger Plaza, where they will then cross in front of the bus and over got to the entrance. Okay, thank you. Got it. Thank you. And and just just in response to what you asked earlier, SEA is still blocking us <laughs> from getting yeah. Nico into the building. <laughs> you know, we're having the same problem at the Harbor School. They they don't facilitate direct communication or direct contact, and I. I've actually, it's gotten to the point where after PS 276, where Terry Ryder walked into that school and there was like half of the room she couldn't use at, at the way she, I, what, I should take that back. Not half. I would say a fourth of the rooms were not as she was expecting. And it's important that educators are able to walk into a building and weigh in on layout. You know, they're spending sometimes, you know, $700 a square foot at these, like if for them not to include the educators in the layout of a building makes absolutely no sense. But there's some, it's some sort of regulation that they have that we have to contend with here to be able to get these walkthroughs and direct communication to happen. Up until the point where we can get this to happen, the only way they communicate is through lists. So they continue to come back to us saying, please send a list of what you would like. Please let us know what you need. Please, here's, the, here's what we're thinking. We actually did get some plans and sizes and measurements from Harbor School. Um, and we were able to react to the measurements um, and go back and say it would be better if. So know that we are working very hard to get you guys in the building but that it is like moving a mountain. Um, but we're not going to give up. But in the meantime, if you have specific concerns, please send them. I think that would be a really smart, and questions. It would be really smart as they are still building. And obviously, you know, we would want to maximize our opportunities. Unfortunately, the gym at Torum got away from us. Although we couldn't have done, I think for those of, those yeah, that didn't screen. get away from us, Tricia. That was that was on purpose. It was on purpose. And I would just want you to know if there is a way that we could have made that a full size regulation gym in that space and they had backpedaled and prohibited that from happening. If we had the space to do it right now, I would advocate to stop construction because I have the emails where they confirmed that there would not be a gymatorium at this school. I have emails from Carmen Farina herself saying they would never build one of these things again because they deal a death sentence to school programming. And when I saw the measurements of the building itself, I realized that they weren't being forthcoming from the beginning because in this particular building, there is no physical way to build a regulation size gym. They don't have the building width. So my very contentious meeting with the SCA recently involved um, when the SCA said to me, we can't do it in a lot of the buildings we're now building schools in because we have to use office buildings. We don't have the ability to build from the ground up. Valid point. The problem is to when she said, so we are creating dance rooms, alternative physical education spaces, really wonderful facilities that will get the kids up and jumping around. And my comment to her was, if you don't build regulation size gyms, you are not going to be able to have sports programming, which for a bunch of reasons is really important. Okay, first of all, the effects on children's self-esteem, physical, mental health, 
the, the effects on children who don't have opportunities through sports can lift themselves up and out. To be able to, to, to say that we are not going to be able to guarantee to build regulation sized gyms anymore in New York City without thinking those things through was really shocking to me. I have to say, I was gobsmacked at this meeting. And what I said to them was, if you really are at that place where you are unable to commit to that or push for that or find these spaces that can accommodate that, then what you should be thinking is not, what can we do instead? You need to be thinking of how to build that regulation gym offsite near the school in another space and have it facilitate one, two or three other schools. Because what we have now is three full-size gyms in what is now nine schools. And what that's going to do to school programming, you know, to sports programming and after school is going to be a nightmare. And then I just heard today, which is not on our agenda, I'll just mention quickly, but the gym they're building at Harbor School is, no, is not regulation either. It's an elementary sized gym for a high school on, on Governor's Island that does not have the ability to run over to um, a, a, a nearby gym. So this kind of thing is why this committee exists and we are going to pass a resolution on this very thing in December, because um, I just got this news. So um, know that you know, this unfortunate thing that happened with the 150 gym is something that, you know, when I looked at the measurements, there's not a darn thing we can do about it. And they just weren't forthcoming then. And I've learned my lesson in asking for measurements, which is how we just got the measurements from Harbor School way before they even break ground. So, um, so we will be advocating for a full-size gym for this school to use in addition to their gymatorium. Thankfully, it's an elementary school, but it doesn't make it right um, when they guaranteed and agreed to a full-size gym. So that's my, my update on that. So, hey, um, Tricia, this mm -hmm. is Wendy. So um, I just am wondering now that since we're gonna have the Southern Plaza with Edgar Street being half closed, which is wonderful because as mm -hmm. you all you know, know, I mean, maybe just to back up for those people who weren't in the room, you know, Tricia was there, I was there, the elected officials were there. I mean, we spent months and months on this. I can't even remember how many hours we, uh, I'm sorry about that, working on trying to get um, all of our concerns out front. And I'm still deeply offended that all of that work, it just didn't matter. And um, so anyway, that's, that's my emotional uh, piece of it. But the second piece is that one of the things that came up in that meeting is that, I mean, the, the plaza outside is, you know, the, the official area is like a one bedroom apartment. I think it was like 1400 square feet or something like that, right? Um, the, the courtyard? Yeah, the courtyard. Oh, much less. It's 1200 like square feet. 650. So I just remember it being like a one bedroom apartment. So that's yeah. probably right, like 650. So yeah. um, oh. I'm terrible with numbers. So it's it's the, essentially the size of a one bedroom apartment that a school with three classes on a grade will be entering and exiting each day. And the entrance is, um, even the gate to go in is fairly small. And so that was one of the things I was thinking now that we you know successfully have heard that it's gonna be, um, you know, we're going to have that extra room on Edgar Street. Can they switch the or make a second gate so that there's an, an easier way to get in and out of that small little space? Um, and then the other piece that I have is that, you know, I mean, is it going to be the PTA is going to have to cough up the money for some sort of retractable awning? I mean, we, we just, I mean, it goes back to, you know, when my daughter, who's now a senior in college, you know, we had to buy all the air conditioners in the kindergarten space at the current PS150. You know, the parents pitched in and we put the air conditioners in ourselves until we got yelled at. You know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, I'm I'm so deeply offended by the work that we all put into this to then get told you can't communicate, you you're not the customer, you don't matter. <laughs> and and I'm I'm just 
you know, I, I don't know what else we can do at this point, but I, I think about this second entrance in my mind, um, getting in and out because lineup is going to be very difficult. It you know, is gonna be very difficult fire drills are going to be very difficult. We, we talked about this for months. <laughs> we have asked for the dimensions of the front gate. My hopes are they're going to be as broad as 234s. Um, and that isn't a done deal yet. So that's good. Um, I have to see what is left after they uh, finish the facade at the Dickey building. By my calculations, they could have an exit out onto the Edgar Street side. It's a small dimension because the, the Dickey building swings around. So I'm thinking it could be eight feet that we have there to full width, but it's possible. And I do suspect that the SCA wasn't even thinking about fire exits because before we fought for this plaza, I think all they had was Trinity Place with three subway entrances and full on you know, commuter traffic. So, you know, this was an important get, getting this South Plaza, because frankly, I don't know how the school would ever have functioned without it. Um, my guess is that is what they're going to do for fire drills. And it would be intuitive to have that another door um, coming out onto Edgar Street. So um, I think that's an easy thing to advocate. We should be for. asking for that. Yeah. yeah. You know, the other thing, um, you know, that the, one of the things that we learned too is the very under the main tower is going to be a retail space that they're hoping it's a grocery store or something like this. I mean, I'm not sure they're going to be able to rent it. And, you know, it's not in the greatest location. I think we should also be saying, you know, should the school from time to time be able to ask the developer, you know, until they rent that space out to give it to the school at a, some sort of discounted rate? Because that could they be... have a tenant. So I ha I've asked who that they do tenant, have a tenant is. Yeah. I heard they have one, but I have asked who it is and I haven't gotten an answer. Mm. Um, but I will definitely, I definitely think if, if it's not uh, rented, that we should be thinking in that direction. Um, yeah. But they also are not anxious to have children mixing with the public. And so it would have to be something that is, you know, carefully done. We have that problem at 26 Broadway. Um, when they went to use the other elevators, when the elevators weren't enough, like we told them they wouldn't be when they opened the charter school in that building, um, they had a really hard time getting permissions to go over to 26 Broadway to use that space because they were mixing with the public. So, you know, these are even younger kids, so I'm sure they're going to be very anxious about it. But at the same time, they haven't I, I really don't know what the plan is for rainy days. I mean, I've I, until we get the DOE in the room with the SCA, we won't get that answer unless they're there together. And yeah, we know the uh, roof space is going to be too small because that, you know, the peck slip space was too small. Right. They do have the auditorium space, which somehow uh, decreased from 140 seats to 120 without notice. I just happened to notice when I was comparing the plans. So I've also asked them about that discrepancy. Um, but that's on one of the lower floors, I believe, and that would provide an opportunity, that space. It used to be the pre-K space that we got um, nixed, and that is now turned into an auditorium with, you know, not a regulation height ceiling, but it's pretty decent. It's supposed to uh, seat 140. It has a stage. It has a backstage. Um, so that was an important get that we got as well at 150 at, at Trinity. Um, so I'm, I'm just confirming it though, in light of the other discrepancies, uh, most importantly, the gymatorium to make sure they're actually following through on what they said they would. So I don't know why it decreased by 20 seats. So I'm gonna find out, find out why, because the, the layout that Rosa sent us um, was down to 120. So, um, so yeah. I wanted to, could I, could I ask a question about this? This is yes, Jeff here. Please. Also, I wanted to say congratulations to Nico and that we missed him over at 276. Um, so you're saying, Trisha, that it's just too late for us at this point to, because I feel like what happened here is we kind of got bamboozled or steamrolled or just lied to. And it's been something we've been talking about since tech opened about this ridiculous concept of the gymnatorium and yeah. how 
the very word itself should just be stricken from our language. It's preposterous that a city that, you know, has done so many public health measures that led the nation, like outlawing smoking in public spaces, opening a conversation about limiting sugary drinks, et cetera, that we would be building schools for young people that don't allow them to run fully is, it's really criminal, honestly, in my view. And in learning what you just said about the, uh, about Harbor School is even more vexing. It's like, how are they supposed to participate in PSAL when they can't even field a team that can play in their own facilities? So my point is, do, what do we do longer term? And I, I guess I want to have some optimism about our new mayor um, <clears throat> in that he has addressed the issue of, of uh, he's talked about how if you start doing too many things to tax the wealthy, for example, he talked about 65,000 millionaires that basically pay 50% of our, of, our, of our taxes, which I thought was an interesting thing to learn. Um, I think we might want to like begin working with him, maybe on even de deconstructing or de or dismantling the SCA because it's just I've been dealing with the SCA since the '90s when I opened a school in Midtown that was a year behind track, and they moved us into an, an airless, windowless space with the with with two weeks left before the school year was going to open in the, in the summer of '93, and we lost forty percent of our parents because they're like, "Yeah, I'm not sending my kids to." a shared space with nine other schools that has no windows. So see ya. So that was how that school, Landmark High School opened. And then they eventually opened us in Midtown. And then they moved, moved, whatever, I won't go on. But the point is, is I think we have to be more proactive than just case by case, school by school. There needs to be a kind of a calling to account of the SCA's abuses. Um, and it's just, we were blatantly lied to. It's like, we've been saying, Bob started to lead the conversation, as I recall it years ago, being like, this gymnatorium thing is preposterous, you know? Well, I mean, think of the work that we did then. Uh, I know. It's good that you bring Bob up and I hope he's here. He is here. He is. He's got so a lovely Bob, picture. I reached out to Bob when they talked about this gymnatorium and Bob jumped into position and got his entire staff to run data as to the usages of our gyms and auditoriums, not only in lower Manhattan, but in district two. And he provided that information within about three days, which was stunning. Right. And I put that into a PowerPoint. And for those of you who weren't here then, you will be probably not surprised to learn that our gyms were in use seven days a week, 12 hours a day to the point no. where I was wondering about hygiene. Like, I don't even know when they clean them. And our auditoriums were in use 65% of the time. So to think that they could combine those two rooms into one and not have programming loss is would be the definition of insane. Yeah. And so it let us know that the way that SCA is looking at things is for self-convenience. And I am not concerned about going on the record with this because I have now been doing this for 14 years. And I can tell you one thing that I am absolutely sure of is that the first question is not the impact to our children. And that's very daunting because it lets us know how forthcoming and how vigilant we're going to have to be in the way that we you know, work with the SCA to get these schools built. I'm not saying these are bad people. I'm saying they are probably focusing on feasibility, cost, um, and other things first. And it explains a lot. It explains why 276's rooms weren't the right size. It explains why there were sharp objects with, that could have impaled children that were at the front door of Peck Slip. It explains yeah, why the up, the, 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 um, up play space at Peck Slip it makes total sense if you have 140 children standing shoulder to shoulder but it doesn't make sense if they're playing. Like there were some critical errors made because of the lack of consult with educators and community right. board members. And we see and that right now, even Millennium's, even Millennium's what appears to be stalled project on 14th floor. Like when we saw the plans, it was sort of like, eh, doesn't do that much for our school anyway. So well, the problem um, is, is that that was supposed to be open space, Jeff, but they had to tie the money to capital funds. And so they ended up wasting, this is a horrifying fact you're gonna be interested to hear. 
but they ended up wasting a huge amount of money building out classrooms that will never be used as classrooms. What the school needed was open space. They have no gym, they have no open space. And yeah, then the, 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 like open space the open space they're building up there is dotted with, with, with pillars. It, it, that's, that's an old building, you just, whatever. My point is maybe what we should be doing more long-term is writing a resolution for our new mayor, calling for a task force to look at the, the ineffectiveness of the SCA as an institutional partner with the actual schools they're building places for. Because exactly they continually they continually blow it. I mean, and they've been doing it for decades. I'm sure it's wrapped up in corruption. I can't prove it, but there, there's but no way there's also, not some wastage going on. And it's just, I think it's time we like to said, there needs to be a conversation about why schools are not being I, if, if you if you had told the people putting moving 150 that they're going to have a postage stamp size courtyard and a weird entry area, it's like we're begging. It's like, oh, you build your giant glassy tower and then give us a little tiny piece in the bottom. To, well, to also, I think the reason us. the reason is the most problematic is you know they're thinking of constraints first and going directly to the ease of building instead yeah. of thinking about pedagogy. And that is a huge problem and I think should be the basis of the resolution because, and I think it is good that we have a new mayor. It's an opportunity for us to make right. some headway with this. And, you know, all things that are citywide and not community-based, we have to come together with other community boards. And so it just takes some coordination. But I do think it's time for a reckoning with the school construction authority. That's all I'm um, saying. And I'll stop. It's such a waste of money. It's such a high price point that they're building at. It's not competitive. We don't have an opportunity to understand what these bids look like. They're going with an architect on Harbor on, on so, Governor's Island that's never worked on the island. So and let's just go ahead and create, like not now, but you know, I think we should probably move on whenever you think we should, but like we could make this a simple, clean call for a task force for the new mayor to look at the SCA's history with schools, building schools, inefficiencies not listening to communities, not listening to school experts on how to build a building, well, lying about saying they're not gonna have a gymnatorium and then saying there is gonna be one. There's there's so many abuses we could list and it should be, it's just time that someone sat down and said like, I don't get how that institution survived for decades, the way they operate. Decades and decades of just complete incompetence at best, at worst. Well, well, and, at, and I, at I, best, I at I best incompetence. That, uh, one more example of that is that, um, we had uh, PS150 way back in the day um, with shop architect parents uh, were public school, you know, were PS150 parents. And we were um, the music room that everyone enjoys. That's the multi-purpose room. That's the cafeteria, you know, the cafeteria, the mu music room, the gathering space for PS150. They wanted to use more green, renewable, modern, um, materials that, oh, by the way, the PTA was paying for. We had some grants, but we were also raising money directly. And the SEA actively was working against them saying, you can't use them. You have to use that plastic molding. Of, uh, you know, we were putting toxic uh, building materials. Like we literally had to have the best of the best people fighting the SEA from you know using more green and more renewable materials and that's the other thing we need an audit because they they don't build healthy buildings on top of everything else so that's that's the and, end of it i'd love to say, have a meeting. And the, the reasoning that they give is is student safety everything's about their code but to jeff's point they then put them in a windowless you know room to incubate them it's they're contradicting themselves I think you can't have it both ways. You can't spend eight hundred dollars a foot to have this glossy thing with unsafe materials, and then other schools that don't even have a ventilation, proper ventilation. It's it's not going to work. And I do think an audit is is definitely called for. And I like the task force idea. Sarah, you've got your hand up. Trish, can you look, because I recall when a spruce was built and a kid was going to be hit from the parking lot garage that they put in the middle of the plaza, 
Right. We had this conversation with the community board and there was discussion about writing a resolution about how these buildings are built and they're set up because I, I mean, it just seems like very much like deja vu regarding and the principal at that point came, no, nobody discussed with her, nobody discussed with anyone. And we've had that same conversation and that was what, Aaliyah was in kindergarten. 2010. <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, so I think there was a resolution and there was, was a request for a task force of how they conduct business and how they, how, how these schools are built. Yes, I do think it's time. And, you know, um, it's obviously going to be a mountain to move guys, but I, I do think with the new administration, we had a really difficult time with this administration. Um, and Bloomberg was actually a much worse so I'm hoping that this new one is going to be more open. Carmen Farina actually was very open. Um, I was very impressed with her. She understood exactly the ramifications of a gymatorium. She made that decision on her own. And unfortunately, someone decided to reverse it. I don't know when or how it happened, but it's very disappointing. And I think she would be very upset if she knew what was happening here. So anyway, um, I am going to be putting it on for December. I have some outreach I have to do after today's meeting. I am going to copy the chancellor. I don't know if, if she will survive the regime. I'm not really sure what's going to happen there. She very well could, which would be, you know, I, I think what anything is going to be better than what we're, we're coming from. And so uh, hopefully we can make some headway. And I think to have a resolution there in December when they take office, um, could be terrific. So look for that next month. And if anybody has any feedback they'd like to send to me, please do that. Um, any points for that? Anything you know you want to bring forward? I'm happy to consider it. All right. Anybody have any other questions on this item? Okay, great. Moving along, is Mara here? Yes, she is. Oh, good. Okay. So Mark Fitzgerald from Community Board 2, Youth and Ed Committee, um, has brought a resolution to us, which for those of you who were here last month know, we had to postpone because we had to do some diligence with the DOT um, and, uh, you know, other, other agencies, communities um, that would be impacted with the street closure on New Street. And we have done that diligence. We thought we were gonna to have to wait, but we heard uh, yesterday at the end of the day that the DOT said that there would be no reason we could not close that street during um, morning arrival, out to lunch hours and after school. They just need to be able to use it for construction access. There's no through traffic there. Those who know the street that on the south side borders Beaver and on the north borders Exchange Place is a street that now has the security. Someone help me out. What are the names of the things that pop up? Active vehicle barriers. Thank you, Mar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it has a bunch of those and most of the time they're up. So, um, but we have found that as a result of construction projects, not liaising with the school, and my daughter was at LMC and I walked up one day and had to stop a demolition of drywall from the 1970s that they were doing right up against the curb where the children were going into the school and they were, they were compressing this drywall in front of them and a white cloud of smoke was going up across the children's faces to everyone's horror. So we were able to stop the projects one at a time, but what Mar had, what Mar has brought to us is something much, much better and long overdue. And so um, I'll let her introduce her resolution to us, but we have cleared all of the community feedback Department of Transportation has reviewed it and approved this to go forward. Mar? Um, yeah, first I, I you know, wanna thank you and CB1 and also the Community Council for the first precinct. They heard us um, a couple of weeks ago and Darlene and 
Sarah here. I mean, so helpful. The entire community and Captain Smith really, really got behind this. Um, as you said, we need, we really needed the street closed. The school is a vertical campus. The kids share a gym. There are four schools in the building. Um, there have been some incidents, conflicts on the street due to, you know, all the activity. And uh, of course, the danger of the trucks and cars and those gigantic active vehicle barriers, you know, like giant claws, you know, going up and down and our tiny little children having to get around them. So um, we wrote the resolution uh, to have the street closed with all the important information evidence and brought it to you and, and hopefully you guys will pass it in support. Has everyone had a chance to read through it? Maybe I should ask, has anyone not had the chance to read through it? Raise your hand. Any questions, comments? Oh, Sergeant Wingert? Would you like to say something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I just want to. Uh, this uh, this proposal came to us came to our attention on Sunday, and the NYPD Counterterrorism Division is is involved with the establishment of the uh, security perimeter around the financial district. Uh huh. And this the street is not closed; it's an active street. We're, we realize it's an active street. Yes, we. The proposal is so, to close it for school arrival, when the children yeah, go out to lunch for an hour, and at the end of the day when they leave and leave it open the other times. But it's it's the only way out. It's the only way to exit any of the facilities that are along New Street, or any or any any vehicle that needs to exit out New Street and go down onto Beaver. There is exchange place. You cannot reverse and back up and exit exchange place going eastbound. That's, that's, so I don't know, I'm not sure who in DOT uh, advised that this was, uh, that there is no traffic and it's a closed street. That's not true, it's an active street. Well, they said well, that, they didn't say there was no traffic. They said that the traffic that there was, was minimal and that it could work with a street closure at certain hours during the day and work around that. Yeah, so that, that's so, what we've heard from them. That's that's fine, I mean, but I, but they're mistaken because traffic traffic can't be managed. How you can't manage? It's the, it's a one way street going going out. It's so a major. It's it's the major. It's the major exit for for this for the financial district for that that perimeter. So, Sergeant, we did have someone on the premises to do an evaluation of the through traffic, and there wasn't any through traffic. So, I'm curious as to um it was just local traffic for construction and we did have someone film the traffic movement on several mornings and so we're happy to hear like what you're seeing that we're not sure but if well you it's can an act be well, specific, well you have uh -huh. sure i can be very specific so you have one you have one wall street that is that's nearing that's nearing completion right so uh -huh. all the all of the vehicles and all the deliveries that need to go to one one wall street need to exit can only exit from Beaver and New Street. So it's what the, would be the explanation for not seeing them in terms of the evaluation of that traffic? I, I don't know. Did, did they see I any traffic it. at all? No, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's not- but, Trisha, can I weigh in? Go ahead, Mark. Hi, Sergeant Winger. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, So I'm there every day. And we're only talking about three hours a day. So the one wall construction, they tend to, they don't, first of all, they have a lot of their deliveries come the other way. And they actually park trucks on the other side of the street. They also have the entire inside, they have all of New Street between exchange and wall where they also they to, park they their to, trucks. They but, also, you don't, but you don't, excuse me though, but you don't understand, they have to leave. 
There's only one way for all those for all those trucks to leave. The and only that's way they fine. Can, the that's only fine. way they but but they but you don't understand though. You're saying that you want those trucks to leave through a street that is occupied with children playing. It's what are those what are the what are the vehicles what are the vehicles supposed to do during those three hours? Are they supposed to idle and wait until the street is closed or reopened? How are they supposed to exit the site? How are they hand, how are they how are they handling on peck slip? It's the same thing. It's a one way street that was closed it's because different. of the kids. How is it's it different? different? It's totally different. It's 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 totally different because this is this if someone wants to find another way out. They can find another way out. How they, on they, Peck Slip? Because the only... it's the only way. It's only one way. And now with the plaza in there, there used to be. Uh, how would they leave? We looked at. So we looked at Peck Slip. All right. We. So here's the deal with Peck Slip. Peck, Peck Slip, right, is closed with the uh, with the school teachers' vehicles. Correct. They are. That's no, right. So no. that's how they. So I that's mean, how they, it's closed. It's, so that's how they. With, with so that's barricades. How they with barricades. You don't, you don't have to. If you can't make that turn, you don't have to go that way. You don't have to. If you're on Peck Slip and you get to the point where the street is closed because it's a, it's a play street, you can turn around and go. So you can exit that area. You, you're not stuck on. You're not stuck on that on Peck Slip. You can exit. You have relief. There's no relief valve, in terms of traffic on New Street. So it's that's so, that, so uh -huh. and that's so that's one thing. And the other thing too is and this is you know the we're we're uh we're very involved with a lot of a lot of the, the work, hard work and efforts of community board one in Lower Manhattan. And we've sat down and we spent a lot of time with the downtown alliance and with community board one in in uh in in ways of addressing issues around the financial district and the security zone that's set up there. The fact that no one from from NYPD counterterrorism was invited to to give you the, the reasons and the explanations as to why we're against making this a oh, we lost um, it's also only three days. It's only three chunks of time. They're not even full hours throughout the school day. So it, I don't know if you looked at the hours that we're proposing, but it's only three hours. So he is just fallen out of the meeting, I am noticing. He he got cut off and just fell out. Jen, if you see him, can you please readmit him? Um, in the meantime, I will let you guys know that it wasn't just the DOT. The Downtown Alliance was involved in this decision. So it's curious that he's mentioning them because this was not, this was well vetted. I'm, I'm not discounting his opinion because I think it's important. And I do think that it's worth following up. And I think, you know, we can do that. We can still vote on this and follow up on it. It is only three hours, the street is closed. And perhaps we can, for the short term, entertain a whereas that covers them for emergency exit. You know, where if there is a emergency of some sort, that there could be a process developed about how they will leave the street. Maybe they make a phone call. They There's a point person at the school that they can say, we need to come through. I don't know, Mar, if you are willing to um, put that into this resolution, but it certainly would be a way for us to get this passed and then do some more diligence. And if we feel like it's necessary, um, do an auxiliary one at another time. But I hate to not pass it if it is cleared by the DOT and the Downtown Alliance. Um, that is fine. And in fact, we have provisions for that in written into our Department of Transportation application. All that information is in there, including all of the contact numbers and who will be doing what, moving barriers in case of emergency, plus the emergency lane. Like it's all there already. Oh, good. It's built what, into the can program. I, can I ask already. a question? Is there, yes. is, there a reason, is there a reason why, can you share that information with us? Because I think it would have been, it would have been, a, it would have been uh, appropriate for you to share that information with us. Before you, yeah, before. absolutely. I, I apologize. That was an oversight. We were told that you know we had to deal with 
this person and that person in this organization and this but there's a security and but it's a, but it's a, this is what this is the, i'm a little baffled though the, it's a security perimeter nobody right? it's a security perimeter did anyone approach the stock exchange um well no so, they didn't so i know okay. that for all right can i finish talking sure so we actually for many many years had an agreement with the stock exchange that they would not activate the barriers and that we would have exclusive use of the street during those hours. This is something that has stood with the stock exchange for years and years. Sometime between the beginning of COVID and now, the people running the stock exchange have changed and we no it's longer have same. contact it's there. The it's the same people. It's I've, been, I've, I've been in counterterrorism since 2009. The people that are in the stock exchange now or the people that are in the stock exchange then, it's the same people. Okay, and, then it shouldn't be an issue because it's in a, and they sh wouldn't have issue with it since it's the exact so same raised, thing that so, we had with so them the for many years. So, all right, so the stock But you know what, why don't you and I connect and I will get you our application and you can review it. Can we do that? Well, you're already approving it. Well, this is a community board supporting it and it is an advisory agency. So there's really no harm in that happening. I'm happy to talk to you offline and explain to you everything that's gone on and everybody that's who's fine. involved in the entire process and we that's can fine. go from there. Is that okay? I'm happy to no, talk. Yeah, no, that's fine. No, I think and I think that's perfectly fine. And there's no. there's definitely a provision for emergency, Sergeant. You fell off the um, call for a while. I just want to make sure that you know that. No, listen, I, listen, I listen. I I understand. I understand the need, right? I understand the need for 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 creating spaces for uh, for, for students that are in facilities that are not built for <laughs> are not built for what they what they're in. They need outdoor space. There is a park right across the street, but I guess. The park that's right across. It's the not about the park. It's not about play space for them, Sergeant. It's about safe commute. It's a really dangerous situation. You've got a seven foot sidewalk and there were demolition trucks parked on that sidewalk and so processing, processing so this, toxic substances. This, it can't happen at that time. It's no, contraindicated. No, I understand that, but, okay. but I thought this was a play. I thought this was a play street application. No. So what's the so all right? So may all right. So it's maybe middle I'm, school. It's middle school. There no, will be no only, recess. So what's yeah, the street being closed for? It's just for okay. Safety. There's 700, 700 children walk up that street in the morning at like between like seven thirty and like eight ten. So it's that time, and then they all leave for lunch. It's at the same time, I think it's like 1145, they come back in like four, 40 minutes, and then they leave between 2.30 and 3.30. Like, that's it. That's all we asked for. What, but what, I don't understand what you're asking for. You're asking that no vehicles are allowed to exit this, exit the financial district during those periods on New Street? Just that that street, not that they can't exit the financial district, that that street is safe for children during those times. During the time, listen, if you go down there, there are 700 kids that spill out onto the street every day at those times. Those cars can't move anyway. It's just an unsafe situation is what it is. The cars can't move anyway. There's 700 kids on that block until the kids clear anyway. And that pop-up, uh barrier what do you call it ballast what is that called again i mean active I have, vehicle barrier <laughs> i have seen that active vehicle barrier because there's so many kids i mean it is dangerous you have to pull the kids away from that sometimes and right. and it's so it's the idea is having a, adults thinking about the children first during those periods of time and obviously if it's an emergency you know we want to get everybody out of there anyway but I, I think the idea that's just asking is to, to, to put the kids first so we don't have construction people just pulling up on the sidewalk. I mean, the hard part is if you don't know, and, and this is what happened when my son was there, people don't know that there's a school there. It doesn't look like a school. It looks like a sad little alley. And that sad little alley, you know, actually is a very vibrant neighborhood at, at these very brief periods of time. 
And the idea is that vehicular traffic and those ballasts and all of those mechanics, you put the kids first and you put all of us grownups who are just wanting to get around, just give a little pause. That's the idea. It should have actually been part of the plan in the building of the school, which is what we've been talking about earlier in this meeting. It no, should yeah, never I, be something where we no, are. I, I, yeah, no, listen, I, 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 find, I find your discussion uh, riveting. And I think, the, I think the challenges you face are, um, are, are severe challenges. You know, we, one of the things that we took part in is, is we assisted with some of the, some of the, uh, some of the concerns we had with co-locating schools and businesses when they wanted to expand some of the, uh, the pre-K and to some of these locations. And these aren't, these aren't appropriate locations for kids to be in. You're so right. I, when you talk about cafetorium. It, They're cheap. That's why the kids get put there. It's cheap. No, it's a, yeah, but that's but that's ridiculous, and that and and but but along those lines, just so you know, like that's the see our in law enforcement and right, NYPD for counterterrorism, counterterrorism. Um, the the best way I, I say the what our role is in the city is enhance life safety. So fire department fire department is life safety. What we do is life safety plus, and that's why if if this isn't being the way it was this plan was. Uh, presented to me was that it was going to be a play street. So just from the outset, the idea of making this street within a, within a, a secure perimeter that's set up to uh, deter from a terrorist attack, to put uh, large amounts of students static within that zone is something that makes me very uncomfortable. So that was one thing, but, but, I, but I take, but I, I, I accept your offer to go over this plan, to look at it and to, uh, and to bring in this, stock exchange and, and to hear some of their concerns and and maybe we can uh, make maybe we can come together on on some sort of agreement yeah the kids aren't moving they're going to be there either way so it's just the idea is just be thoughtful so no one gets hurt but closing the, but there are but see uh, there are traffic there are severe traffic implications by by shutting yeah, like but, but there's there's not traffic there because you've got those ballards that are up. So the only people that are coming in are people who are kind of insiders, construction people. Right, exactly. Insiders. It's not. It's not. So but that's this right is not now, normal traffic. But it's, it, it's not normal traffic. But there is traffic, and and what you know, you look down range. One one Wall Street is going to, is not going to be a construction site. It's going to be a large multi multi use building, and you have all those businesses along New Street, right? you know, all up and down from Beaver Street all the way to Wall I would argue the kids were there first. So what I'll say, Sergeant, Sergeant, what I'm gonna say is that since we have to wrap this up, I'm gonna say that we have been monitoring the street for a long time. There is not through traffic steadily moving down, down New Street at all. There is those barriers there and they will have special circumstances where the barriers will come down, a truck will go over it, the barriers will go back up. If there's an emergency, it's written into the application. It is, de is definitely gonna be a given. We, we understand that people are gonna have to come out of there in an emergency. So in terms of terrorists, terrorism especially, um, that would be you know, something that probably wouldn't even need permission. I think that what we're talking about is the scheduled visits to New Street by construction companies and demolition companies. This is why this has to pass because they have to be prohibited from scheduling those activities at that time. I fully suspect that any emergency exiting, any sort of imperative through traffic that has to happen, that we're gonna be able to work that out, but it's going to be better for us to pass this resolution and prohibit the scheduled activities and then work on the exceptions than it is the opposite. Does that make sense? I don't think you can, I have, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll sit down and, and I'll go over your plan as you presented it, but it's not just, you're looking at this as just being construction activity and there are other businesses in there that get deliveries and there's other reasons. And it's not just, that's the only, that's the old, that's the main exit for the financial district. Aside from William and, and Exchange Place, that's the well, second. The Downtown Alliance is very aware of the businesses on that street and they have given this resolution their blessing. 
So either they have worked this out with the businesses one by one, if there are deliveries happening there, um, I have to imagine they would not have approved this if they hadn't done diligence. So we weren't, the reason we postponed this is because we didn't have this information last month and, and everyone has done diligence. I'm very happy you showed up because I'm very regretful that no one had reached out to you. Your voice is very important to us, obviously. Um, you protect us, so we care very deeply about it. It's just that we do think the scheduled activities on that street have to be prohibited, and this is how we have been advised it happens. So again, I think the exceptions are going to be easier to handle than it is trying to prevent, because we've tried this for years, these things from being scheduled without a street closure. And I think that's really where we are. And so please know that we will commit to working together to make sure those exceptions for anybody who has a hardship during those three hours a day will be considered. Um, we have no reason not to consider them. Who, who manages this? Who manages it? The DOT will manage the street, street closure. How are they gonna do that? Okay. The same so way they do a peck slip. So the street is actually managed by us and crossing guards and support from the first precinct. And it's all written into the application. There is a phone number, there are two contacts. In the case of emergency, if somebody needs to move something, if somebody urgently needs to get down the street, there is a number to call. There will be signage directing everybody to where they need to go. It won't be confusing. It won't hold up any progress or construction or anything. It's just clear guidelines for everybody. And of course, we will accommodate any important emergency situation that has to happen. Uh, Mark, can I just jump in here uh, very quickly? So I'm, I'm actually the president of the community council for the first precinct. And we've been discussing this since before national night out, two months before June. And so I'm actually, I think the part that I am very confused that it's always been about safety and that's why everybody was doing their due diligence. I wanna know where, I mean, it's actually a little bit scary that you think there was a thought that this is a play situation. So that's the first thing because we've been discussing it. So, so, the, I, so I don't so know how, how, can I just understand how, how the communication, because there's so many subjects when it comes, we all live in the financial district. And so there's a lot of things that are brought up. So are we just supposed to be talking to you and like completely not de be dealing with the first reason? Because if that's the case, at least we should know what the process is. So the, so the, so the infrastructure that's, that was set up after 9-11 to protect the financial district is the counterterrorism, it's counterterrorism infrastructure. So it's, so it's outside of, it's, it's outside of, uh, the purview of the first precinct. So if the, per if the first precinct was being asked about security infrastructure for critical infrastructure for, this, for the, the city of New York and the nation, it, they needed to reach out to counterterrorism. So- And they were, they were getting reached out about safety of local children in a local school. And that's what they were reaching, what, that's what we were talking about for the past the you know, finance, six months. So the, so all, so the, so the streets are managed within the financial district. And the reason why New Street is managed for traffic is because of counterterrorism security overlay over the financial district. It's a counterterrorism issue. To answer your first question, why we thought this was a, a play street, the Downtown Alliance reached out to the stock exchange and told them that they needed to participate in this phone call. And they did this on Sunday. And they, and they told the stock exchange that this was an application for a play street. So that's why uh, my impression of this is as a play street, that's why. So maybe Downtown Alliance is confused as to what this application is for. So can, so just so moving forward because there's actually quite a few subjects that we are involving the precinct when it comes to kids in the financial district. Some of it is streets, some of it is other. I mean, are we supposed to, are, is the precinct supposed to reach out to you or are we supposed to reach out to you? What is the best way of communicating moving on forward? Anything that has to do with uh, the, the, the streets within the financial district security zone, it's a counterterrorism 
uh, issue. Sergeant Wenger, isn't it um, something that happens organically that when these kind of things come up, that the Downtown Alliance reaches out to you? I mean, I'm, I'm alarmed that you weren't included in these discussions that have been going on for quite some time, the, given the, the importance. It, it is a very, it's, that is very interesting because we sat down with, uh, with uh, the Downtown Alliance for years talking about how to, how to redesign or how to reconfigure or how to make the financial district uh, security um, equipment more, um, more pleasing and more uh, aesthetic. We uh -huh. deal with the, I, I have communications with the Downtown Alliance on the location of garbage cans, where they reach out to us and ask us where they can place uh, composting garbage cans within some of the security zones, either at the World Trade Center site or within the stock exchange. So the fact that they didn't reach out to us on this is very disturbing. And I, I almost wonder if it was done intentionally. I, you know, I, I hate to think that would be the case, but what I want to say is, um, given the length of our agenda, I want to say that we care very much about what you're saying here. We commit to making sure there are provisions for anyone needing to exit this, this road at those times that they will be able to. We obviously, every, every initiative that we have of this kind has to be you know, as things go on, there are opportunities to make changes if things aren't working. So you have our commitment as a committee um, and as a community board to make sure to show up for these things as they unfold here. Um, but I do want to vote on this resolution because it has been approved by all of the city agencies we need this approved by. We have an unsafe situation at this school. Um, and I, like I said before, I think the exceptions are going to be much easier to handle here than the rule. And I think we need to address this rule. And so, um, you have our commitment. In fact, I'd like you, if you're willing to put your contact information in our chat so that Mark can reach out to you and provide you with this application so that you can see the details of it. And if you would like to come back and see us again next month, we would be happy to have you and we can talk further about it. Um, and if we need to do something, um, if we need to do something auxiliary to this resolution as a result of the findings or a result of, you know, any unsafe situations that this resolution causes, we will be happy to do it. We just feel the situation we have now is untenable. We've, it's been going on for quite some time and we've had some very near misses. So, um, so I think that that would probably be the most advisable way to go from here. Um, but I want you to know we are grateful that you came. We care very much about what you've said and we see this as a beginning of our communication, not an end, um, but that, you know, we really do have to make a decision. Sergeant, I private messaged you my phone number do you have it if we haven't lost him? Again? I got it. Okay, He's still here. <laughs> yeah. Please reach out to me. Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, I think a month is too long. So if we could do it before that, that would be great. That's fine too. I mean, we have lots of meetings outside of this forum. And so you have my commitment. I'm going to put mine here as well. Um, and we're happy to talk to you, you know, next Tuesday. So I just, uh, like I said, we have we have student safety issues here, so um, we do want to bring this to a vote now. So, Jen, can you take us through on a roll call? Sure. If some a member from the floor can call the question, and someone else second, please. Call the question. Can someone second? I second. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead and start, with Trisha. Yes. Jeff, I think I have to recuse possibly because it's a do is a DOE related. Um, I'll play it safe. Also, I hear Sergeant Wingert's. Uh, I don't want to get this thing going again, but like I hear what he's saying. I, I work in the area, and I don't know how people would get out of that area. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna. What should I do? Uh, recuse, I guess. Recuse. Sure. Okay, recuse. Um, Okay, Sarah C. Sarah 
Our castle, are you there? Okay, she's off. Okay. Um, Helena? Uh, yes. Okay, Wendy? Yes. Okay, Duron? Duron's not here. Okay. Eric? Yes. Okay, um, Kenny? Ken Kenny's a yes. Okay, Bob? That's me, right? Yes. Okay. A Judith? She couldn't be here. You want to. Okay, Andrew? Zelter, yes. Okay, and Sarah E? Yes. Okay, with all the votes counted in, the motion passes for this resolution. All right, and Sergeant, I'm very happy to hear from you as soon as you'd like to be in touch with either of us. We'll stick with this, okay? All right, great. Thank right, you so care. much for coming. Sure. Have a great time. Have a good night. Very much appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, moving along, we are, um, Bob Townley is gonna talk to us about his idea for a youth services directory. Won't take a lot of time. Uh, so many years ago, there were, the youth committee used to publish and update a youth service directory of all the youth services in community board one. In fact, I think it was mandated uh, by, the, by the city at some point that the planning on the youth agendas had to put together a youth, and there was a youth coordinator, yours truly, who used to put it together. That was my job at the community board when I worked to Paul Goldstein <clears throat> when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, and um, so there's been a lot of shakeup in the community and there are a lot of new parents in the community uh, who, you know, it's a great place to live. They're raising their families, but information, you know, I don't, I would, I would um, take a back seat if I could, if someone would say, well, Bob, when you did your youth service directory, there was no Google, there was no, there was no searching involved on the computer. So, you know, I take that into consideration, but even for our planning purposes for a needs assessment, it may be useful for us to put together all the services in a community. Uh, if the community board staff could do that with input from the members of, of the community, that would be my uh, uh, su suggestion. Thank you. Anybody have any comments, questions? I have a question actually. Yeah, okay. Bob, on the community board, we often come upon this thing where it's hard for us to have for-profit businesses come as presenters, mm -hmm. um, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, generally, they have to be orgs. We have a lot of for-profit youth providers. So sure. I, that would be a question for Lucian is when it comes to this directory, what would be our limitations if we handle it as a community board? And sure, Jen, we, we take that back to him. Yeah, yeah, we could, we could, we could uh, answer, get that it, that question answered pretty uh, easily. My, my, uh, um, uh, the way I, I, I would think it's not a, that profit, nonprofit, youth services, non-youth services. Uh, it doesn't matter for um, the community board or the downtown alliance or any of these agencies to put together um, a listing of what exists for people and tourists or whatever. That's my, I, I, but we can get it, we can get, but the, the, the other question I would have before we start asking if we can put nonprofits, for profits, who can go in it, is who would do that? That is for me, if we decided and we thought it was a good idea, which I, depending upon the day, go back and forth. I know that a lot of parents ask me for information and ask my staff for information. So it would be great 
if there was a place they can go for information. Right now, the Downtown Alliance, I think, would be a, I mean, they do have a directory. They're set up for directories online yeah. and in print. Their problem is they only serve to Chambers Street. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that's something that I actually wanted to approach at some point. But anyway. Exactly. Um, because, because north <laughs> of Chambers Street is filthy. It, it's just that I see us as one neighbor, one community board. Yeah. So um, I'm sure there was a good reason though. So anyway, um, I like the idea, Bob. Does anybody have any other comments or questions about it? Didn't the broadsheet do it years ago? Oh, that's an interesting, I, I don't know. They, uh, they, yes. they did. Yes, they have, they did for many years. Um, the doorman's guide. And yes. So we supported that. and. You know, and they distributed it, and it was, I thought it was rather useful. It was rather useful for for profit businesses, like where's, where, you, where can you go for Thai food? Um, so mm -hmm. uh, that was also a, a really good, um, uh, uh, and I think the Alliance probably has that on their website. Um, I, I don't know. Do I know Deborah Glick also did that years ago, but I don't think she's done it done it of late but it was obviously broader based on her district yeah for me for me there were five or four preschools when i did the youth directory i heard somewhere someone said something to me that there were over 25 preschools in community board one there are yeah and someone said to me i mean there are all these things from coding places to art places we're packed i mean we are we people you know we're full i mean and and uh you know so if someone wants to find a tutor for their child or you know something it, it just would seem to me that the planning board would be the uh entity to do that um, I think that, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have is that we have different representatives for different parts of our community board, like because of this Chamber Street thing. Yeah. And it's always been a challenge for us to provide these directories as a result of having two entities. And but I don't think we should quit because of it. Yeah. I was just um, talking about our challenges in regards to it. So, I so, Bob, I, I think. Locked down. It could make sense to, I don't know how set up community board one is to take something like this on given the size of the staff. Yeah, yeah. But I do want to think about it and, and put it back on December and let us all knock some okay. heads about it this coming month. And and Trisha, um, if you think of anything, let me or other people know and let's let's progress on whether or not this would be, you know, I sometimes late at night I I just cut and paste and <laughs> you know, uh you know, so so let's let's keep it going. But one of my points and that everybody knows and that young people who are now raising their families is what a vast array of services there there is for raising your child here in lower Manhattan. It's there definitely good. is. It's I, we don't have any ball fields and we don't have enough ball fields. But, you know, I just would say that there was gyms. discussion for, about the, the school, gyms. the gym. Yeah, no gyms. There was discussion I, that the Battery Park City garage was going to be taken over by the Battery Park City Authority and that the top of it was going to be a field and a play space and maybe inside of it. So as part, we'll all be surfing <clears throat> someplace. But that is something to look at for long-term planning because that's going to come, that'll come up again at some point. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, we're going to have to start using alternative spaces for some of these things for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want uh, to say, but also gym spaces could be part of the directory. Where do you go if you, if you, you know, if you want to play, um, look, you know, flag football on a Friday night, where do you go? Right. There are places. But a lot of people don't know where they got where they got to go. I know where you got to go, but they don't know where you got to go. Right. 
No, I think it's a really good idea. So we just need to see who's, you know, think about who's going to Okay, think about it with the board. I'm sure they're not going to be that keen. On. Well, no, it's just a matter of, it's a matter of staffing and research and follow up, right. as you know, I mean, it just is what it is. And then they have the constraints of the kind of businesses. I mean, they just yeah. have some inherent, yeah. you know, considerations. So, yeah, yeah. and, and um, this doesn't have to be done today or tomorrow. It's just something if to put on the table. No, I think it's really good timing. I think it's important for all the new people coming into the neighborhoods. So yeah. thank you for well, bringing it up. Lot. Um, Moving on, um, high school admissions results. So last month we talked about um, doing a resolution. I unfortunately, the parents who left, who didn't get what they wanted, um, they're not anxious to talk about it. And I think without the statistics, solid statistics on what happened, um, it's very difficult to, to formulate this resolution about how to advise the DOE going forward. They have, they have refused to consider more choices that I did learn that they're only doing 12 again. I did see that they listened to the one whereas, I mean, the one therefore be it resolved in our previous resolution about high school admissions in that they are starting to have information sessions about some of these schools that they sent our kids to against their will that was a step in the right direction. So that has happened. They did push back the SHSAT date, which we were super curious as to why they were sending out sign-up reminders when the date had passed. So it looks like they're doing that test in December now. So that's moving forward. They're not changing the SHSAT format, um, which is also what we asked for for now. And um, so I wanted to just bring this to the committee. I am not seeing enough material here for a resolution. Um, I have reached out to the high school superintendents and the middle schools in our community district. I have encouraged them to um, reach out to us with anything that concerns them as they go into this application period. But I don't think we are going to talk the DOE out of changing back this admissions, um, the admissions changes they made last year. I don't, I, I see no evidence that no matter what kind of pressure we put on them, that they will turn back the time on this decision. And I do see that they are making some steps in terms, in terms of better communication this time around. I don't have high hopes for it. I do think we're gonna be stuck with the same um, statistics in terms of maybe not the same, but probably statistics of children that don't get matched. But unless they change the admissions um, criteria back or unless they back out of what they decided to do in, in, in terms of how they approach this, I don't think we can expect better results than we have. You know by taking away the district preferences, by taking away the, um, the way that they handled admissions previously, we are not gonna be able to expect that all of our children are gonna get one out of 12 choices. And I think that that is something, you know, until the rest of the city says, this is a disaster, which they're not saying, we're not gonna have much that we can do to affect change on this. Um, you will rarely hear me say that, but we do have to know where to put our energy. And if, if anybody else can see something here that I can't, I would love for you to bring it forth because I'm happy to fight, as you know. I'm just, uh, you know, once you take away district preference from an admissions method to go about getting that reinstated so that 20% of our kids are going to get picked up again, is gonna be very difficult as for a lot of reasons, which you can understand. Um, it did create diversity um, by doing this, which is a good thing. It's just that I think what we're gonna to have to fight for now is building more schools. One of the things that someone brought to the committee at some point is enlarging the schools that we have. 
So that's something I thought about um, and need to think more about because some of the schools, you know, aren't going to be able to sustain um, enlarging their infrastructure. So I don't know. I'm I'm really coming to you all to say I've evaluated this this past month. I've looked at what we have. I've seen the actions they've taken. I'm not feeling as though we have a really solid resolution in the ones we gave them. And uh, I think that more appropriate at this time is a community board letter. I reached out to Tammy and Lucian around it. I would like to do it in conjunction with other community boards. And because we've all done resolutions on high school admissions talking about what a disaster it has been, the way they went about it. Their goals are worthwhile, but their process was a disaster. Um, and so that's really where we're headed is in a joint letter with other community boards um, timed with the change of mayor. So, but if anybody disagrees with this or has anything else they want to share with me, please, you know, raise your hand, speak well, out. What I, is it? Sarah? What is it? Uh -huh. Sorry. It's okay, Jeff. Um, you can go ahead. Uh, no, I'll wait. Sarah had her hand up. Go ahead, Sarah. She did, but she took it down. I think I Sarah had agree. her hand up all, all no, Sarah's <laughs> had her hand up all the night. <laughs> all right. Do you want to weigh in on this or no? No, if I start, I won't finish. So I will <laughs> let everyone because this subject, you know how I feel. I just, I just yeah. want to, so then I want to know, like, what would be, Rosie, you're next. what would be in this letter? Because I mean, I guess what I, I've not been able to follow the details of this change at all, but I was speaking with Colin as the principal of Millennium and we don't even rank students anymore. It's entirely done through a central place where we send some rubric of what we're looking for. And I have no idea how anyone gets matched up anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, one uh, of the one of the it's about to get things. personal for me. I've got a seventh grader, so you know I have a year out. You know, and it's just what a shit show. It's um, a shit show. And I mean, why, it really is. It's like these people think they're tinkering with like I don't know a pie crust rather than the actual infrastructure our families get into schools. It's nuts. Uh, so we don't have. I mean, the thing that surprises me, Jeff, we don't have a lot of high school principals pushing back on this. And we don't have a lot of middle school. Our middle school um, guidance counselors. My they, theory, my theory right. is it's one less thing for them to do, and they don't. And and I hate to say that, but it's a lot of work to rank all those students, and it's one less thing to do. Um, and we'll see. But it's it seems crazy that schools have literally like just here's what we were looking for. You guys decide what's going to happen. Then you get what happens. You get people not getting them matched up at all, and you just get upset families. And I don't get how they tinker with something without. Was there a public comment? I guess it was during COVID, so who would even know? So there. So there, my there question were, literally is: before all this complaining, is what's the letter going to say? One thing I wanted to say, and I I had to step out for a second. I caught the tail end of what you said. I am. I don't think the solution is to enlarge the schools that already exist. Right. The, the school... I don't think it's going to be feasible. It's a, it's a, it's a nice idea to fit more people into schools that everybody wants to go to, but physically. It's not though a nice idea. I, I just want to say that really clearly. It's like schools lose a lot of character when they go above 500. That's like a study show that people can't really know a community above 150 and you get to 500 that's a lot. Seven people are like, oh, these small schools with seven hundred. That's not small. That's well, a lot it is of people. In terms of the country, if you look across our country, this is our our public schools are very small here compared to the traditional zoned suburban high school. Sure, they're, um, they're 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 servicing a fifty thousand person community. Correct. Right. Uh, they got a house. They got a giant building up on a hill with twenty five fields, three gyms. You know, of some of them. And you know we're crammed in three three stories three stories of an old ancient building. It's beautiful all the windows, but all the pillars are nuts. We have no physical. You get what I'm saying. The bottom yeah, line yeah. is, I don't think the solution should ever be to enlarge small schools out of their personal character. That's why they're small. And right. so start more small schools. 
Is it richest city, I mean, richest city in the Western Hemisphere? Well, pass, the ugly, pass the, the ugly, simple penny tax on transactions on Wall Street and give us all the billions and let's just start servicing our families. It's fucking crazy. Sorry for my language. Well, there, okay. there's a lot of, um, I mean, the letter to your question, to answer your question, um, the things that we've identified, um, we've identified certain things and we represent our schools and our principals, we represent our community. We liaise with our community education council. And for those who are at the CEC meetings, we do have a considerable issue with um, the segregation at our Manhattan schools. I, you know, when we look at the demographic of New York City, um, you know, it's a really worthy goal to provide more opportunities for all the, the, the students across our city. I think that there's some misinterpretation um, about this. And what is really concerning to me is that it's difficult to talk about the fact that parents are really funding a lot of the curriculums across this city. Nobody wants to say this out loud because it's just an awful thing to talk about. But when the DOE does not fund our schools properly and schools have to choose between guidance counselors and science labs, that's when you know you've got a resource problem. And if PTAs are called upon to fill in the gaps in these resources, we are never going to have equal opportunity across the city. And so that was my argument at this meeting was you have to fortify, and this was in our, in our uh, resolution, you have to fortify the schools across the city by letting PTAs share funds, by refunding the budget cuts of 2008, which you never did. We cut a million dollars. I was on the PTA at 234, it was $940,000. They cut out of PS 234's budget in one year. I run a business. And if somebody cut my operating by $940,000 in one year, I would not be able to function. How they expect these schools to function, they're daring them to succeed when they make these budget cuts. And what PS234's answer to that was, we fundraise. And they did. And they came together. And they were able to dig themselves out. But there are schools you know, across the five boroughs that do not have that luxury of that parent demographic. And so the ugly truth is, and it's not just in Manhattan, you have, you have areas in the five boroughs that also have uh, people who have the ability to, to, to fill in those funding gaps. And you will never have diversity and equality and resources until you face that ugly truth and, and start funding our schools properly. The DOE has counted on these families to perform so that our schools perform and make them proud. This is so wrong. And really what we need to do is, is, is face that wrong, change that wrong, meet these funding needs, fortify the schools across our, the five boroughs of New York City, and then look again at this situation. I don't think families that are in the far reaches of Brooklyn are so incredibly psyched to come into Manhattan just for the sake of going to the school. I think what they would actually like is for these schools to be over there in their neighborhood. I think that they're probably very deeply resentful that, that the schools that they are wanting to get their kids into have all these resources and that schools in their own communities do not. I'm, I'm not speaking for them because I, I haven't had enough charrettes with them. I've only spoken to community board chairs from those communities and they have told me that. And, and I would feel the same way if that was my community. So I have to say, I think this, this preemptive strike they have made in the efforts to desegregate our schools um, without doing those other things is going to come back to haunt them. And it's going to really affect our community. It's gonna create urban flight. There could be huge economic impl implications about people losing faith in the admission system. Um, and that's what's going in that letter. And you know, it was in our resolution, 
And now I think it's time for something um, in, in terms of a letter um, represented by community boards across the city. That was what was missing is us liaising with, with these communities that the city was projecting things about. I think that's as disrespectful as it is to, to change the admissions methods without you know, doing diligence on what the impact will be. 30% of our children with no match is completely unacceptable. And I mean, it's an outrage. So if you're gonna give them 12 choices, you need to fulfill one of those 12. That's a lot of choices. We're giving those same amount of choices for college. Um, so, you know, they have a right to get into one of those 12 schools. Otherwise, why are you even giving them a choice? It's disrespectful. So, I mean, we can do another resolution covering all those points, um, but we did think that a letter could be um, really useful now referring back to, to our resolution. So that's where, that's where things are right now, but I really did want your feedback, everybody. Um, I think that's Rosa? a good idea, sending a letter, Tricia, and distributing as you have worked so hard and un uncovering. And it's really sort of a Don Quixote thing with, um, you know, you fighting a, a windmill. It's very, very complicated because it's, it's, you know, there was a social, a great social um, uh, activist piece to this and they messed it up. And who knows what's going on if it was successful this year. And also I have to say, I was gonna laugh when you said one or two things you said, well, I don't know really what to do here, you know, get a letter or something. This is the same committee chair who just took on the counterterrorism unit of the and New York Police Department and told them, well, we'll sit and talk to you. Um, and uh, I just thought that was completely hilarious that that but it is a very complicated issue. And I got to tell you, it's not nice for anybody, whether that from Brooklyn, Brownsville or Bronx or Jamaica, Queens, my home borough, that that someone doesn't know where that kid's going to high school. It's it's the worst. It's chaos. It's and, and it's, it's really. Chaos. It's really awful for everyone. There isn't anyone who was really served here. And I think I'd that's- I'd like to see that letter. And I would also distribute it also because I think it's worth distributing. Uh, I don't, yeah. I think we're going to send it um, probably uh, next month. So I think you guys are gonna have a chance. Whatever to you do it. I mean, you might be ahead on this issue two years because something's gotta change. You can't yeah. have this go on in the city of New York. Can't well, there's a lot of changes. I think Jeff's point about the SCA is a really valid one too. And yeah, I think, yeah, you know, all that, all that. There, there are just some decisions being made without the right, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. input. Yeah. Um, so, so that's really where we're headed now. Rosa, I see your hands up. Yes, thank you. Um, so first of all, Tricia, I totally applaud your outrage. <laughs> I think you <laughs> you are Absolutely. very good at focusing it. Um, and I think that your dedication to actually addressing these issues instead of just, just being angry about it is incredible. And so 100% in your corner. Um, related to that is my concern that there's a significant shortfall in funding for the current school year because the number of kids um, in our schools has gone down also because of the flight that you just mentioned. Um, and so for school budgets this year, like, you know, I know last year we were able to convince them to um, fund, but this year, I mean, we have possibly even a worse problem now because um, they have significant costs and they um, yeah. have an unreliable student population that's in flux because of coronavirus continues to be, is it possible to do some sort of a resolution that urges the city to keep funding based on pre-coronavirus levels until the schools are able to adjust and adapt to whatever is the new normal? Because I don't think that expecting them to adapt like just now is um, reasonable or possible, frankly, because the staffing issues are still the same. Um, even if the number of kids have declined, then the, they still need the teachers for the classrooms. <laughs> they still need the facilities. They still need the supplies. I mean, 
like I just got a text saying we need more soap and paper towels for our school and our classroom. I'm like, seriously, the, the, the DOE doesn't have enough money to provide paper towels and soap. They I have, mean, th that's they messed have so up. so much money. They have so much money that, I mean, it's hard to even talk about the money they got for this pandemic. Um, they did commit, I, I thought, and I would like to hear feedback um, to not asking for the money back if there was a difference in the projections as, as the That's reality the on, on October 31st. So for those of you that are on PTAs in our schools, you'll have to report back to me because it's just, I mean, it's only November 9th and they just took that inventory on the 31st. But I was told that they would not be required to pay back um, any money based on attrition. So please make sure to reach out and let me know if that happens or not. That's going to be a huge and important support for our schools um, right now, because we are all, all of our schools are down in terms of um, enrollment. So, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then I was just going to say, just because I, I, my child's only eight. And so I haven't gone through the brain damage of applying through to high school <laughs> or middle school yet. Um, thankfully, and I'm going to try to not do it for as long as I possibly can. But um, hearing you guys all talk about it is uh, honestly freaking me out. And so you're saying that 30% of the kids that applied for a spot in high school from our schools actually were not assigned a spot in our high schools? Like, I mean, no, legally, does they, the DOE have to give them a spot? So the DOE did not give them one of their 12 choices. And in some cases, the smaller percentage got nothing. Hmm. Um, of the ones that got nothing, most of those got an assignment, but only one that I have heard of, again, people for some reason are reluctant to give me the statistics. I'm not really sure why, um, but only one that I have heard of, one waitlisted kid at Quest to Learn got in there. The rest of them went to their assigned schools. LMC sent like five to Richard Green. He said he hasn't heard from them. It seems to be going well with the report I got. And then two of them became homeschooled and another, you know, several of them left the city. So the appeal process doesn't seem to be very vibrant. No one got a lot of help from the uh, DOE, the, the, the systems they set up for wait lists and being heard and being helped. Some of them were able to call the schools directly and their timing was good. Um, off the record and got a spot. I heard that people moving into the city, which is something we've heard before, which is horrible. If you move into the city in August, you actually have an advantage over those who have been assigned elsewhere, put on wait lists. If you're lucky enough to call the school and say, hey, we just moved in, do you have any room? Some people have said yes. Um, it's just, the process is completely broken. So, you know, um, I do think that, again, I, I think that their idea of creating more opportunities for all students is the only good thing here. Everything else they've done in terms of process has been a total disaster. They didn't think it through. They should have taken, spent some time in planning and transition and fortifying the schools and, and communicating with the parents and doing school fairs for the schools that they plan to send them to if they didn't get one of their 12 choices. No parent is going to want to send their child to a school they never heard of. After giving 12 choices, you've asked them to research 12 schools, they did it, and then you're going to send them somewhere else? Like, where does that happen anywhere else? Like, nowhere. So, so I think these are the things that have gone wrong, um, and they're well aware of it. My God, they couldn't be screamed at any louder this year. So I do think the letter uh, with other community boards will have impact. I think it has to be in concert with, with community boards across the city at this point. So they can see representation. It's not just, you know, they, they tend to see us as a haves in terms of the haves and have nots. And it's been something that we've had to contend with for a long time, as you know. 
Um, but if we are disproportionately affected, we need to talk about that in concert with the city as a whole and really sort of see what happened everywhere, see where all the failures are, and you know, try to appeal to this new administration to try to reverse some of the aspects of this initiative that failed. So I hope that, you know, this is done in time for your eight-year-old and the seventh grader that, you know, that's also in this community board um, will work as quickly as we can. But I do think this is going to be the, the most effective route at this point, seeing that we all have resolutions, all the community boards that in Manhattan had them, and they didn't have, they did have some impact. I want to acknowledge they've done a couple things we asked, but it hasn't been very vibrant. And I think a letter at this point could be could be powerful. So I hope, I mean, you know. I hope to. Thank I hope you. It, I hope it can. Anybody else? All right, um, I will continue on with that. We're gonna be putting that together with the office this coming week. Um, Tammy asked me to put this on this agenda. I'm gonna have to help me out here. Transportation impacts of local law 114, suggestions for future open restaurants law agency rulemaking discussion. So I, I thought it was a mistake. I thought it was someone had given us one of transportation's uh, agenda items. She said that they are considering expanding the curbside areas for restaurants as a permanent thing. And she thinks there's an opportunity here for our youth in the form of stroller parking and uh, wayfinding and charging stations. So she might be right, you know, like maybe we should speak up if there is something in here for us to weigh in on. Um, so she wanted me to come out of the meeting with a couple ideas from you all on things that we might advocate for in these interesting um, new spaces that have become available to us on the curb. Anyone? This is Rosa. Uh, do you mind if I interject a little bit? Because no. um, we discussed it at land use yesterday, which is um, where a, a lot of the sort of um, concern came out about the privatization of public space yeah. and about whether or not this is really the best use of public space. And um, and I think where, where Tammy was probably going is, is, you know, the subject of, you know, if you are going to say, okay, parking spot could be something else, like a restaurant shed, then is a restaurant shed the best and only use for that, what's formerly a parking spot? Or mm. can, it, can, can this be an opportunity for us to reimagine what that spot of public space could be as an alternative to actually work for us as a community, right? And so it's it's about the fact that that there's a spot which previously one single vehicle sat in for free for a certain amount of time or maybe paid, I don't know, whatever the deal is. Um, now a restaurant gets to occupy that one single spot because we, you know, just lived through coronaviruses and, and a lot of, you know, the restaurants were really, really suffering and they needed it to keep them breathing. Um, now, if we're thinking about permanently giving it to that restaurant, well, then can't we permanently consider giving it to something else that might benefit our community more than that private use restaurant? So, I see what you're saying. Uh -huh. so, so I think that that was sort of where our mind was going. And then also, um, you know, really simple, stupid stuff like, you know, garbage, you know, <laughs> addressing the piles of garbage that we have on our streets because we have no real garbage plan. Um, but then also, yeah, like for kids, scooter parking or whatever, or, you know, I don't even know how that would work or waiting space outside of schools areas, or maybe a, you know, plaza or seating area at that other school that we were just talking about earlier, you know, maybe instead of parking spots, you actually have like a protected lane that has some seating for kids to chill out or whatever, um, like they do outside, you know, some of the coffee places now. Um, mm -hmm. So, so basically, it's about reconsidering the the privatization of that space, but from a youth and ed lens. 
if, it, it. if the city is going forward with doing something like this anyways, then why should the restaurants be the only ones that benefit? And, and then by virtue of that, really the, the landowners be the ones that benefit. Why can't it be schools? Why can't it be recreation? Why can't it be something else? Right. Okay, Katie. good. That's a great explanation. Thank you, Rosa. So, um, very well. Can I ask? So, uh, Jeff? I was going to say, hearing Rosa speak about that way was really interesting. I foolishly had never thought about how we privatize public spaces because I was just so happy to have a place to go hang out with my friends in the, in the pandemic and, and wear winter coats and sit under heaters that some of which have now been outlawed. So, um, right. so I was just thinking, I mean, I can't, my initial thought was let's just return them to like what they were because there needs to be traffic flow, which seems like a boring thing for me to say, but I was just going to say it. But then as Rosa was speaking, I was thinking why, if, if I don't think it should just be something free that restaurants get, that's for sure. Um, once we emerge out of this, and it seems like it, there's revenue being generated by those spaces for the city when they're normally car spaces. They can ticket people that are illegally parked, et cetera. Right. Why not have it be, since we're talking about education and we're youth and ed, why maybe our dream would be that if you want to maintain them, they are rented spaces or they're, they're tax spaces, uh, whatever, however you want to call it. There's a financial transaction happening between the restaurant and the city and the money being generated by those spaces goes into a public fund for public education and to build schools. How about we build schools out of the buildings that were built out of those public spaces? So just throwing that out there as an idea. Anyone else? You know, I, I um, uh, you know, of course I, I have the environmental bet, bent. I showed Rosa today on her wonderful walk under the Brooklyn Bridge Park, which was amazing, FYI. Oh, um, if you haven't gone on that walk yet, everyone should go with Rosa. It was really helpful. But um, one of the things I showed her is that um, up in NoHo someplace, one of the sheds was collecting rainwater off the roof and then putting it in a cistern in this very attractive way so that then they could have plants around. Um, you know, so that's an environmental bet. We're talking about the youth and ed, but I think there could be a component of urban gardening with schools in all of these, you know, street planters. Yeah. And the other thing I have the thought is, um, you know, what Bob was talking about with the directory, I, I always feel like there should be a, a town square that we can post flyers. Um, you know, flyers have gone out, you know, you're not allowed to put a flyer or a card up anywhere. And, you know, there's something really lovely about going into like an old fashioned co coffee shop in a neighborhood or like how Bazzini's w was, where they had a bulleted board that you could post things that were coming up and you could you know, just see what's in the neighborhood. And I, I kind of see like maybe the side of these sheds um, being, you know, designated as like a town gathering spot or like a, a flyer type of place. You know, if you have an upcoming, you know, idea, you know, I just, the, the other thing that's been really interesting uh, that is just in the New York Times yesterday is um, trying to do stuff like uh, a swap of stuff um, and, you know, not spending money and keeping things out of the landfill and all this kind of idea, which again, I think that, you know, benefits everyone, but it's so hard to find out about these things. Um, there's, you know, there's no town square that you can post information. Um, yeah, no, I love that. so anyway, um, that's, that's my random thought. Thank you, uh, Wendy. I love that. Uh, also, one Sarah? of the things the kids always uh, talk about, they can't, like in the suburbs, they can't sell lemonades and have stands. So maybe if this, these spaces can be open for kids to do their Girl Scout cookies and some of their, I don't know, lemonade or hot chocolate or whatever. So give space to the kids to also to do that. And whether it's for their own, you know, how whatever kids do with this, that money or for fundraising for schools, I think this is something else. But I love also uh, Jeff's idea about renting it out and then giving back to the community schools, whether the existing one or new schools. Yeah, I do too. That's a great one. Anyone else? On that last subject, this is Rosa. Um, I thought there was some sort of restriction on having money earmarked for specific uses when it's general tax revenue. 
I, I don't know why I'm getting that arcane about it, but you're I, I absolutely think you, you're correct. But I, I was my mind was moving as you were talking, Jeff. And I think that if we go about it in a community based way, you know, if we claim that the community piece in terms of our restaurants, you know, is keeping the community alive, that we're giving specific restaurants free rented, you know, free city space for private use. So that breaks the rules, right? So I'm thinking if we can work it into the context of that community-based give, that we might be successful. It will not be able to go into capital funds, but it could go into some other bucket that I just have to think about. Well, you know, couldn't they, couldn't, sorry to interrupt, but couldn't they, yeah. I mean, any law can be amended, right? So, I mean, you, you could theoretically say, uh, I mean, I'm just saying you could possibly amend the law so that it could be a toward a capital fund. And if you thought about it, not just punitively, it would be almost a fundraising concept for restaurants to be like, when you come here and spend money with us, you're actually contributing to the public schools of New well, York. Well, see, I was actually thinking along those <laughs> lines, Jeff where you have something that is a separate initiative, right? So that's what I mean about the community piece. You could do something more along the taste of Tribeca with that money. If you can't take taxpayer money and put it into one city agency, they just, it's not something that I don't think we're gonna have any luck with changing that law. But we certainly have other um, mechanisms that we can trigger on the community level um, if we can funnel it that way, that could work out really well. And there could be some write-off situation, you know, like we, we have to be really creative about the way that we do it to motivate all the partners, right? So, you know, because Tri Taste of Tribeca, it's a fundraiser. So just have to think about that one, but I think it's a, it's a really great idea. Yeah, and, and Taste of Tribeca is going to need some help because PS 150 is leaving Tribeca. They don't even know if they're going to continue or not. It's up right. for discussion. Yeah. 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 But if I if I could suggest maybe going after some bigger fish, um, for instance, I think that it would it's actually super logical for the city to charge an infrastructure fee for any new development, right? Because the reality is that any new development that happens requires the use of infrastructure. If you build a thousand new apartments. Well, those 1,000 new apartments usually have people, some people, some portion of people that are coming in with children, right, that need schools, which is a challenge that, you, you know, you're facing and you face in this, you know, community board every day. They also so need it suit does lines. Happen. They need it does happen, oh. Rosa, but the only unfortunate part of that is that it's triggered by the lot. So there are only certain lots in lower Manhattan that trigger infrastructure. We found this out during overcrowding. Mm -hmm. um, and they were indeed responsible to provide infrastructure and we did get some infrastructure from them. But what was unexpected when they zoned this fine town is that people would want to live down here. And so they did not plan, the urban planners for lower Manhattan did not give us enough of these infrastructure triggering uh, lots. And so a lot of people got to build as of right that should never have. And that was really, really difficult during those awful dark days of over the really severe overcrowding here, trying to scramble once we saw that 101 Warren uh, and 200 Chambers were the only infrastructure giving buildings that we had in that dense part of the city that they were building over there, like 100 Barclay, is it? What's the glass one on the river? No infrastructure. So, you know, it was very, very difficult. Um, we had to go to the developers, prey upon their, you know, um, goodwill a lot of the times. We did have some trigger points where we could, um, you know, prevent them from having the tax breaks that they came in to have. There were a lot of deals that were made, but I just thought to take that opportunity for anybody who wasn't around at that time to understand how this, how infrastructure is paid for. Um, and they did make a lot of changes after that time when they saw the mistakes and the difficulties that we had as a result. I mean, for sanitation sure. was a disaster. 
Yeah, like for instance, like one wall street. being asked to do here or, tonight? Because I personally do not like sorry. the sheds. I I would never take a nickel for any of those nasty rat infested falling <laughs> apart pieces. I would take so, them all down. I have no problem with sidewalk cafes. You could even put a table and a chair in the street. Um, I love my friends at Gee Whiz and, and Tribeca Kitchen, and I love them to pieces, but the shed's got to go. I wouldn't take a nickel. I'll be, the, 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 the one on Harrison Street, look, uh, Puffy's put out chairs, tables, they put some in the street, God bless them. Across the street, the fancy restaurant build houses uh, and and they need to go. They 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 need to go. They're they're dirty. They're rat infested, and they just need to go. And you can take if you feel sorry for the restaurants, lower the sales tax on them, and give them some year long relief or something. But the, thank you, the, Bob. The, I'm yeah, sure. yeah, thank you, Trish. Thank you, I'm Trish. Here. Well, I mean, they're not going to age well unless there's some regulations put they, down they on them. They look that's... like shit now. <laughs> Part of my language. Right. That's, yeah, the well, ones you're always, talking about, you know, Bob, look literally like uh, like uh, refugee centers. That I can't believe that's a fancier the restaurant. Rats, like, the rats. Little refugee sheds. Go to Dwayne so, Street. Look at them. There's rats running out at night, all under them. So they they love in it. The, in the interest of time, guys, because we are getting late. Um, we getting are ridiculous. only being called. There's another committee for that. Um, so we're being called upon just weighing in on what we would like for youth if it turns right. up that we have can weigh in on on the uses of these spaces. And right now we have a list of um, town square where we can post flyers, urban gardening, um, stroller parking, protected lane for kids to hang out in, um, and then the infrastructure, the give back to the public schools. And I think that's- In the sheds? It, I'm just curious, you're saying to take the sheds down and put those things? No, or put those they're things talking in about, the they're talking about if they go forward with this concept, right, Rosa? Is that how you understand what concept? it? concept? Why, I don't understand. The concept of taking public space for a different use now. Well, you know? might, be, might be not the to have a shed. planning on make, the city's goal is to, is to make it permanent. So right now it's temporary. It's a temporary measure, right. and then once that before that expires, the city's plan is to make it permanent. So make if the city permanent? is going the the allowance for these sheds on on the streets and our right. sidewalk. So if it is to move forward, within which parameters would you like it to move forward, or uh, within which let parameters? The kids, let the kids would practice you like demolition. <laughs> What do you, I mean, what, that's like a, what kind of question is that? I'm sorry, Rosa. What kind it's of question not my is that? Question. Like, I won't take it personally. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying, what are they saying? Oh, we're going to let these people keep their sheds. What do you want also in these spaces? No, no, what they're it? saying, no, no, what they're, what they're saying, and, and I apologize if I'm messing this up, but I my know. understanding of what they're saying is we're planning on making it permanent. Um, so what should we be considering and how we make it permanent? Oh, take them down. I wouldn't even, who's, so, who's so thinking of making them permanent? Would not make them permanent. I wouldn't make them permanent. But, but if the city were to move forward anyways, despite oh. your personal objection, right. then what would be in it for youth and ed from a youth and ed lens to, to actually <laughs> say, um, we want this to be considered or we you know to for us to support it it would have to have x y and z nothing yeah okay my, my i would say i would say I, I would i would like to bridge bob's complaint which i love um with sort of the idea that i i I'm, i think it was wendy i'm not sure who said it but even just like if they were became urban gardens or you know the rats might love that too though right bob but it's yeah, like that would know. be something for kids well, to do like I, you, I know you, the one you that, that, i know what Wendy's bob, you pair them so with, beautiful you one pair out of them, 20 of them 30 of them 40 of them 50 of them are beautiful the rest are pieces of junk 
Well, you have to imagine I, it's just the space, Bob. It's not the actual. It's never not happened. The thing, never happened. It's not the things that are there. It's what it's if, if the never, city's never willing to win. win. So the word on the street is, Bob, that if they become permanent, they're going to have a lot of regulations and they're have, going to have to be rebuilt because they clearly aren't sustainable. Yeah. So so I see what they're after. Rosa, I think you explained it really well. Thank very well, that. Rosa, very well. And so it's I think Bob's that fault. we have our list. We have our list. I think Tammy will be happy with, with it. Um, and so, uh, so can I, I just take that back I, to the list, I just ask, can I add one suggestion? Sure, if, Bob let, if Bob will let me get in a word edgewise here, yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate his, his diehard Jets hat over there. What, what a guy. Stays with the team no matter what. Um, the baby community. Uh, I, I would just say the, the easiest idea I think we have is the, is the garden idea. And I was just to add a wrinkle to it from the youth and ed perspective Friends. would be you pair that with schools. So a school, X school has these set spots near their building and the kids go there and they learn about farming. I mean, it's certainly a much helpful, more wholesome thought than what they're being used for right now. But rats yeah. might love that too, because if they're growing food, yum, 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 yum. So just throwing that out there. Yep, I love it. All right, good. Thank you everybody for your feedback on that. I think we did better than we even thought we would do. I, hope I, was um, on my I will put that in. And unless anybody has any new business, um, I think we're good for tonight. Hi, everybody. Good, good night. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Have a good night, everybody.